author, and uh, now he's a big data guy. Uh, he wasn't just now a big data. Welcome back. Thank you, Max. Great right. to be with so, you. So just to wrap up from our previous conversation, you know, you, you went to the intelligence community and you said, hey, you know, markets throw off a lot of data. Right. And if you know how to read it, Correct. it helps you, you know, predict the future or, as you would say in Wall Street, discount the future. Right. And then you've added a lot more data and you've come up with this uh, and you're at Mariglam and you are the chief global strategist there. And uh, artificial intelligence, we didn't touch on that at all. And so does that uh, a key part of the product as such? Right, this is actually what they call third, uh, artificial intelligence or AI, this is really third wave AI. So first, first wave is sort of you know, big data. Second wave was machine learning so that the machine would re reach conclusions which would then iteratively put it back into the algorithm so now the machine is teaching itself. Third wave is external uh, inputs from something like Watson or other machines that can actually read plain language. So you know, every, every 10Q, uh, 8K, um, you know, uh, all you know, 10Ks, uh, footnotes, uh, hundreds of millions of pages of information, it can read all that more than any analyst or all of Wall Street combined could do. For meaning, uh, we're working with a Finnish team of cognitive scientists and linguists to, to advance the state of the art in terms of word identification. Like, I, I could write a write code that says, you know, look for Max and Kaiser in the same sentence, and it's probably you. Okay, but you can get way more sophisticated than that. We're doing all of that. Um, okay, is there a risk of, um, I just saw a video on, uh, with China, you know, they, they're, have uh, remarkable data gathering abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, they are essentially surveying the entire population. Mm -hmm. um, they, people living there have given up the notion of privacy, more or less. Sure. They said, you know, we're willing to give up privacy completely uh, to the state. And um, at, is, is this a risk? Um, f in other words, you're in the intelligence community, you're looking for attack vectors. Mm -hmm. You're looking to keep everybody safe. Mm -hmm. The trade-off, is that you're putting a lot of data in there. It's coming from a lot of sources, social media, obviously, where people are pouring in their lives into social media. Right. And, um, you know, how much the privacy factor, how do you weigh in on that? Is it, a, is it the same world that we lived in 30 or 40 years ago? Has the world changed, uh, or are these things still valuable? Uh, it's absolutely uh, changed radically. It's not the same world we lived in 30 years ago. It is in some ways. Like, human nature doesn't change. Human nature hasn't changed in 50,000 years. We're, we're basically uh, Ice Age cave people. Quick, quick in, digression, uh, but yeah. if so many machines are inputting the data, Aren't we, in fact, leaving kind of a human-based uh, society and moving more toward a machine-based society? Because yeah, well, the machines is... are informing the data, then the data is making decisions based on the machines who are then taking that data and acting out their machine worlds, and then it goes in this uh, loop of feedback loop of machines to machines. So right. aren't we abdicating hum our humanity? You're a big guy in the whole... Uh, you know, you're you're an art. You're a, you're a Christian. You know, you're you're a big fan of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, is this it seems like we're forsaking our humanity for the for the, for the mark of the beast? This is the devil, Jim. Are you are you caving into the devil? I'm not caving into the devil, but I think you're you're onto something in your description of this. And uh, this is what Ray Kurzweil calls the singularity: is the merger of man and machine. So, and you know, this is portrayed in uh, Blade Runner 2049, which I saw. I thought was a great movie, by the way. Everyone hated it. I just I love I love three hour movies where nothing happens that was kind of but it was you know it was very very deep but yeah that that's what we're merging on now what uh and the government's involved in this of course but the private uh the private firms you know the google the facebook we all know who they are yahoo and amazon and all that i mean they're just data mining like crazy and you know I'm, i like i like books i buy a lot of books you know and so i buy a book and says well you bought this one you might want to buy this one too well often it's yeah that's interesting and maybe i will buy it so they're, they're obviously onto something privacy is gone uh, you know, you okay. So just just to, just to, so in other words, the question was one of privacy, and your privacy feeling there is that privacy is gone. Correct. And and you feel comfortable with that? No, I don't. I'm, I'm acknowledging your point. I, I agree but, completely. But the, the, the trade-off for security is privacy. In other words, if I felt like I would be surveyed less and another 9/11 would happen, right? I, I'm since I'm a New Yorker, I'd say yeah. I don't give it. I don't care. Yeah. Let another 9/11 happen because you know stuff happens. Big right. big deal. You know I don't get it. I don't understand the huge response to 9/11 to begin with. Here's here's what troubles me. Uh, I would I would not care if the NSA surveyed everything I do. They don't actually do that, but they you know they 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 suck up a lot of metadata. We all know. I wouldn't really care about that if I had confidence that it was only being used for national security purposes. But I don't. 
We saw during the Obama administration with you know, Lois Lerner's surveillance of the Tea Party and uh, prosecutions of uh, uh, General Petraeus and Dinesh D'Souza. I'm not saying that they both pleaded guilty. I'm not saying they didn't do anything wrong. I'm saying they were singled out for political reasons, and there's a lot of that. So I have no confidence that while the government's collecting the data, ostensibly for national security purposes, all it takes is somebody like Obama and uh, Valerie Jarrett to, to target you, and then all of a sudden that's a whole different world. So that, that's troubling to me. The other thing I think where, where people can resort to self-help, this stuff is addictive, uh, and that's, you know, it's, it's just very basic biochemistry. So, you know, why are people addicted to heroin? Because it feels good. Well, that's, you know, endorphins and things. Well, those endorphins are triggered by a lot of things other than drugs. Uh, I mean, they're, they're sex addicts, they're alcohol addicts, they're gambling addicts. There are many, many kinds of behavior that are all addictive, that have the same biochemistry. Well, it's pretty clear at this point that holding that thing in your hand. So I've started just, you know, I go out and leave my cell phone home. You know, I just I try doing that more and more. Right, uh, social media is addictive because it gives you a, a, a high or a buzz. Well, it touches on the same I think endorphin. The device is, right. I, I think social media way. is addictive in that way, but I think that it's the devices themselves. This goes back to... Uh, a little before most people's time, but Marshall McLuhan said the medium is the message. It wasn't so much the content, it was the medium that you were getting it through. So, I mean, I, you know, I come into New York a lot. I was, came down here uh, to the studio today, and I, I had myself in my pocket. It was off. I turned it on later. But everyone's walking around like this. You know, you all know it. My, I talked to an Uber driver. He calls them the blue faces. Four people get in the back of the car, and they're all staring at the screens, and their faces are blue in the dark, but they're not well, talking I, to I, each I, other. I understood. So, so you, you, you've opened up a thought here where you, you, you're conflicted. You're, you, you feel a bit conflicted about all this. In other words, the, the dividing line for you is that the data has to be safe and, and used for, let's say, national strategic interests. Sure. Okay. But, you know, the, the data gets hacked. All data gets hacked. Right. We haven't seen a database not get hacked. Correct. The government database gets hacked traded. all the time. Yeah, yeah, I mean, beyond, yeah, beyond like Obama, yeah. let's say, targeting folks, right. I mean, obviously, that's clearly a dictatorial breach of the Constitution. Correct. Uh, and that's bad. But, but the data gets hacked all the time, right. too. So how do you resolve that conflict? In other words, you feel comfortable that your work, which is heavily dependent on data surveillance, in the, in, and you've given up on privacy, and, and, and you've admitted that th this is seemingly like the work of the devil. How do you, Jim Rickards, you know, what, what, what institution in America today do you trust? In other words, you trust this institution right. and you can say, you know what, all this stuff troubles me, but I know that X is unimpeachable and, I'm, and I salute the flag t to right. that. What is that institution? Well, I'm a member of the most countercultural organization on earth, which is the Catholic Church. We're, we're so out of fashion with the you know, conventional wisdom. So that's, that's an institution I trust. But um, getting back to my work versus you know, the work of the NSA, we're using completely open source data. So we, yeah, we buy a price fee from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the New York Stock, anybody can do that. It's not free. But anybody can get that information. Um, you know, Twitter's out there. If I, you know, I use Twitter a lot. I, I have an open Twitter account. You don't have to belong to Twitter to read my account. So I choose to put that information out there, and so do hundreds of millions of other people. So that's that's not really what but I. But the, pro that's the, not the algorithms are troubling, Jim. You know, the algorithms yes. can be programmed to make money on Wall Street. You know, they pick a price and then they do the trades and meet that price. Sure. They manipulate markets. So, of course. It, so the algorithms can be used to manipulate social behavior. You know, Facebook they has are. been caught. They are. Manipulating social behavior absolutely, with their news feed. Absolutely, absolutely okay? right. So Which you're you're developing a w more sophisticated, weaponized version of this with this product. Well, Isn't that getting into some more trouble? Look, we're doing something very specific, which is, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you where the euro is going to be tomorrow. We're going to tell you where the euro is going to be in six months, what the Fed's going to do in six months, you know, how the economy is going to do. Those are, we're, we're sort of long, you know, kind of intermediate to longer range uh, predictive analytics and capital markets. We're not trying to sell you a book. We're not trying to, you know, we offer this to institutions. How about investors. this for a vector? You say, oh, there's a bomb coming in from jihadis. Right. Okay, we predict it. So we're going to drone them. Yeah. Okay, does the database say, wow, you know, we invaded their country a few years ago to take all their oil and resources and we're a out of control empire and we're murdering people for money. Does the model suggest that maybe the actions of the U.S. military should be curbed in that sense and maybe there should be a more comprehensive foreign policy that doesn't prize uh, g genocide in this way? Right. Okay, so we're not policymakers. Uh, I can't tell the Pentagon. But what. is it in the data? If the data is blind and it just looks at specific outcomes, you're facilitating and exacerbating a failed policy, and you're making death for hire 
and nor normalizing it. You know, one thing we don't do is get our blood pressure up. We're, we're analysts. We, we, get the, we get the information. We do, we do consider geopolitics in addition to capital markets. I can't tell Rex Tillerson what to do in North Korea. I can't tell General Mattis what to do in North Korea. But we can analyze it using a, a Bayesian statistic, an a priori hypothesis about the probability war in North Korea. We update the probability all the time. Actually, w within the last 24 hours, my probability of war with North Korea, which was 70%, uh, went down a little bit. I extended the timeline. I had it before the end of March. Now I'll kind of go out to summer based on some things that Rex Torreson said yesterday to the Atlantic Council. That's an example of good Bayesian updating. Don't get married to a particular conclusion, but increase or decrease the probabilities based on incoming data. So we do analyze it and we do advise clients uh, as to you know what we see coming, but we don't change the outcome. I'm not, I'm not pushing, I'm the, I'm not pushing the trigger on a drone missile. Sometimes we get a rent a car, we do the geo locating sure. system. I never use it's those. not working yeah. and it says drive into that brick wall. Right. You know, I don't drive into the well, brick wall, all, I override the system. This happened to me recently. I was with my wife, we were in Australia, we were in the outback, we had the driver, we a very bright guy, nice guy, he couldn't have been nicer, but he had one of those uh, GPS kind of things. And we're driving, all of a sudden he turns off the main highway, we're going to dirt road, and then gets on like a, a tertiary road. And I'm like, is this guy gonna like take us somewhere, turn around and shoot us and rob us? Like, what's going on? You seem like a nice guy. He gets to a fence, he goes, Oh, uh, the thing says I can keep going, but I can't. He had to turn around right. and roll away. Well, that's my point. I, so well, when, well, when, well, but you're right, but I never do that. I, I use maps. I'm actually old yeah, but you're, school. I you're, get a you're, map you're, 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 Okay, I wanna, I, my point is I wanna touch on a couple other things here. Sure. On the Kaiser report years ago, yeah, the US first pulled the trigger on weaponizing SWIFT, you remember? Sure. Uh, which is international, uh, you know, against their RAM. For a while. Yeah. Um, and you and you, the alternative, you, you predicted that alternative payment systems would erupt. That's kind of what's happening, right? Correct. Iran, Russia, Venezuela, these countries that are being sanctioned and they're abusing SWIFT, they're inventing, thanks to algorithms, thanks to technology, thanks to cryptocurrencies, they're inventing their parallel systems. Sure. Is that a good trend? Uh, not for the United States, it's good for them. I mean, this is this is geopolitical hardball. I'm on the, the board of a think tank in Washington called the Center for Sanctions and Illicit Finance. And my colleagues, you know, great people, these are people who kind of invented uh, the financial war on terror, meaning they, they were they were in the White House, in the Treasury after 9-11, during the Bush administration. All the laws that, that we live with today, they either wrote those laws or wrote the regulations or enforced them. And, I, and they've been extremely effective. This stuff is really powerful. But I tell them, be careful what you wish for, because if you keep hammering people with this, de-swifting them, which we've done to a number of countries, they're going to do the workaround. Well, they're almost there. So I would expect Russia and China to come up with distributed ledger technology, not Bitcoin, by the way. Bitcoin's a, a sideshow. A serial but, ledger? I mean, I mean, a, 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 a distributed, distributed ledger. Distributed, yeah, that's the new name for like block, a, mm -hmm. blockchain. blockchain DLT, distributed ledger. distributed ledger technology. Distributed ledger, uh, military grade encryption. Maybe they'll have a Putin coin or a Xi coin. It won't be Bitcoin, but they'll come up with their own coin uh, and then transact among themselves. Right. So maybe Russia is paying for China with this Putin coin, and China settling its. So it's a de-dollarization. Correct. Which you predicted for correct. many years. That's right. That's right. Ho ho ho! Merry Christmas. This is our pre-Christmas episode. It's going out a few days before Christmas. We don't actually have an episode this year on Christmas Day, but you know, a lot of people say Santa Claus is not real. They think it's just magical thinking. So I thought my headlines today would reflect this magical thinking. Obviously, Santa's real because we're all getting a lot of presents, right? Magical thinking is stopping us from taking to the streets. This is from Truthdig, and they were looking at this tax reform policy and how it's a big, huge giveaway for the wealthy and taking from the poor again. And they're asking, why is nobody going out in the street? And part of it is the magical thinking that, you know, the Russiagate hoax will save us or or one of their various magical thinkings that if we go to the voting booth and we'll elect somebody and, and somehow that person's going to fight for on our behalf rather than the corporation's behalf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so in other words, uh, there is no there there. There's no help coming. There's no cavalry. There's no place like home. There's only ruby slippers that you can click three times and take you over the rainbow to a fairly magic land of shillelagh sticks and leprechauns where only cryptocurrencies grow. <laughs> yes, of course you can take Bitcoin to the afterlife and to your fantasy world. <laughs> Many call Bitcoin a fantasy currency, but those are not my headlines. 
Uh, I'm going to look, I'm going to answer the question of why people aren't taking to the streets, and I'm going to talk oh. about these fantasy headlines. And the first headline here might be one reason why people are not taking to the streets. Robots are being used to deter homeless people from setting up camp in San Francisco. In San Francisco, autonomous crime-fighting robots that are used to patrol parking lots, sports arenas, and tech company campuses are now being deployed to keep away homeless people. The San Francisco Business Times reported that the San Francisco SPCA, an animal advocacy and pet adoption group, put a security robot to work outside its facilities in the gentrifying Mission neighborhood. The robot's presence is meant to deter homeless people from setting up camps along the sidewalks. So the robot is known as K-9, and it's, it's there to uh, prevent crime. Well, this is obviously part of a dystopian nightmare where the RoboCop, you have autonomous robots and machines and drones uh, targeting human beings economically. They're not participating in the grid. They haven't purchased anything in six hours. Therefore, they must be homeless. Therefore, they must be killed and swept up into an open pit, lighter fluid doused on them, set a fire. And uh, what's great is that these new autonomous robots will probably be all jacked up with face recognition technology and all kinds of databases. So they'll just come up to you and be like, hey, Bob, uh, we noticed you haven't bought anything on your credit card in over 14 hours. So you're no longer used to society. And then they put a hypodermic needle into Bob. They inject him with cyanide and they sweep him down okay. the road. This is supposed what? to be our ho, 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 Merry Christmas episode. <laughs> it's Soylent Green. Soylent so, Green is people. So, of course, um, they, you, they do have all our tracking devices and our smartphones are keeping track yeah. of us and where you follow. Maybe that's why they don't want to go out in the streets. But in terms of this canine robot, when our robot overlords become more advanced, this one's not quite advanced because it was deterred. Uh, I'll show you the interesting Merry Christmas story here is that the canine robot circling the San Francisco SPCA has drawn mixed responses. Within the first week of the robot's deployment, some people who were setting up a homeless encampment nearby allegedly, quote, put a tarp over it, knocked it over, and put barbecue sauce on all the sensors, according to uh, Jennifer Scarlett, the president of the SPCA. Right. Well, then you're <laughs> damaging corporate property, which is becoming a felony. So then the next, the rough flying robot was moved in and the flying armada of tanks moves in and the, uh, you know, aerial bombardment of hellfire missiles is targeting. Remember, it's not about homelessness because there is no such thing as home. I mean, we're all on planet Earth. We all share the same home. It's about commerciality. If you're not, if you're not using your credit card, that's defined as quote unquote homelessness and you're no longer used to society. You're, if you're not putting yourself into debt, if you're growing your own food, if you're sustainable in any way, uh, you are targeted for death. Uh, this is the new uh, eugenics slash fascism, which is coming out of the global elites in order to keep their sidewalks clear so that they may better access their freaking, you know, castles made from all the ill-gotten gains that they've stripped out of the economy over the last 30 years, thanks to corrupt Fed and central bank policy. Okay, so now we're moving on from magical thinking to unreal thinking or unreal reality. And that is this city in Alaska is warming so fast, algorithms removed the data because it seemed unreal. Last week, scientists were pulling together the latest data for NOAA's monthly uh, report on the climate when they noticed something strange. One of their key climate monitoring stations had fallen off the map. All of the data for Barrow, Alaska, the northernmost city in the United States, was missing. And this was because the temperature in Barrow was rising so fast that the data was automatically flagged as unreal and removed from the climate database. It was done by algorithms that were put in place to ensure that only the best data gets included in NOAA's reports. They're handy to keep the data sets clean, but this kind of quality control algorithm is only good in average situations with no outliers. The current situation in Barrow, Alaska, however, is anything but average. An algorithm has wiped this town off the map, off the data. It doesn't exist. Um, this, of course, could help. Many people would like to deny that 
uh, there is no warming in Alaska, even though you could see, we all saw the video of the polar bear starving to death right before Christmas. We also can see, even from the photo in this article, that Barrow, Alaska has no snow. It is, it's snowless, and it's the northernmost town in America. You can, you can deny reality all you want. And it seems the algorithms are, will help you. Maybe they don't want you to do anything to fix it. Maybe because these robot overlords want to take over. In the first story, we have robots that can drive away the homeless. So you can pretend that there are no homeless, that there, there is no poverty created by Silicon Valley and blah, blah, blah. Well, it's the equivalent of a hedonic adjustments. You know, in economics, mm. when the government doesn't want to pay any more to Social Security recipients than they can, or they don't want to pay cost of living adjustments. So they change the way they calculate inflation by substituting, let's say, steak for hamburger uh, as a classic example. That's called a hedonic adjustment. And then they look at that data. They say, you see, inflation is not, uh, is not accelerating. So we're not going to raise rates. We're not going to have to pay any more money out for cost of living because there is no cost of living increase. You see, that's what the data tells us. So here, You've got man-made global warming incinerating planet Earth and causing an eco-holocaust. But the corporations feel like, you know what, that might cost us a penny at the end of the year. So we'll do a hedonic adjustment to our algorithm. And we'll take out this city in Alaska that would flag us to take action appropriate for survival of the species. And we're going to instead rely on our balance sheet and our algorithm, like having a GPS monitor in your car that's pointing over a cliff. They're saying, I don't care if the cliff is there. My algorithm says it's not there, so I'm going to keep driving. I'm going to do a Thelma and Louise. I'm going to go right over that cliff because that's what the data tells me. I'm now a flaming ball of wreckage at the bottom of the canyon. I'm dead. I'm incinerated. I'm cooked. But you know what? I did it because the, for the algorithm. I salute the algorithm. To heck with America. To heck with people. To heck with civilization. Numbers are my god. Numbers are the key. I support the numbers even if it kills me. As we established at the top of the show, Santa Claus is real. A lot of people think it's magical thinking, but he is up in the Arctic Circle. So there could be a, a real world consequence of this absence of snow up in Barrow, Alaska, is that he might not know it's Christmas because he assumes, you know, once the snow comes, that's when all my little helpers come out and help me. And I put together all the packages of our Christmas presents and the back of the sleigh and then Rudolph you know, flies us around the world and we deliver all these packages. But if he doesn't see the snow, we might not get our presents. Well, Rudolph is transitioning this year. <laughs> it's becoming uh, a different species. Well, he, he have... better not become a polar bear because it's not good for them. It's no longer red nose to help Santa through the storm because there is no storm. There is no Christmas. <laughs> okay. Just a Grinch. The You're Grinch. the Grinch of Kaiser Report I'm this year. I'm the Grinch year. of Kaiser Report. There's going to be no Christmas this year. It's been canceled. And then finally, here's another AI fantasy. Uh, I guess it looks like that. All oh, those Who's in Whoville are going to be torched. All this. <laughs> so The Lorax all, is gone. All these robots and algorithms taking over. They, Of course, apparently, they also need to be entertained and amused just like Who? humans. Algorithms, oh, really? AI, artificial they need intelligence, to be robots. Well, that's what this next headline suggests. Here's what happens if you let a whimsical robot write the next Harry Potter chapter. Watch out, writers. Artificial intelligence is coming for our jobs. Just take a look at this chapter of Harry Potter fan fiction. Uh, the, the robot called it Harry Potter and the portrait of what looked like a large pile of ash is a three-page chapter of literature produced by an algorithm. Trained by Botnik Studios on the meat of Rowling's expansive magical universe as an author-assistive predictive text document, creator Jamie Brew and other writers help nudge the algorithm in the right direction. The result is just as weird and uncomfortably, for some of us, readable. As you might expect, filled with the characters and whimsical vocabulary notable to Rowling, the logical plot, however, is not its greatest strength. So it does like come up with a whole bunch of bizarre sentences and realities and worlds. We might be replaced. You by know, robots. predicted all this was uh, William Burroughs. You know, yeah. and Naked Lunch and other classic texts. I think he was stoned. Right, the opiate crisis. He was on heroin. <laughs> uh, the you know ripping apart of pages and concatenating them and rearranging them and the collage technique of literature, and uh, the fantastical uh, nature of his otherworldly, quasi science fiction, uh, informing us about the future, that it would be without any connection to what we would identify as a human species, as we become cyborgs. And it's going to be Harry Potter and the flaming train wreck as the future comes at us at 
breakneck speed and just plows over everybody with futuristic police bots injecting cyanide into our children and processing them for frozen food. You're going to have fetuses armed with guns shooting at people so that they're not aborted. They're going to actually shoot the people trying to abort them with gun-wielding fetuses. That's going to happen in 2018, I predict. Hey, and, and, and uh, before we get right to the, the gist of it, uh, update everybody on gold money. I understand you guys are now uh, trading in Bitcoin as well. If somebody wants to uh, t cash out some Bitcoin and buy some gold, they can do that now in other cryptocurrencies as well. They can do that now at gold money, right? Yes, I think we. Uh, when it comes to um, funding an account, we take a number of cryptocurrencies, uh, but we also offer the facility for people to deal in Bitcoin as opposed to just use a cryptocurrency to fund an account. So um, I, think, I think the main thing is that uh, anyone who uses our platform knows that uh, you know, we do full KYC, anti-money laundering, alter banking standard and all the rest of it. So the risk that you have with an exchange, and that is that you know, the Fed might raid, raid, the feds might raid it or something, um, that is minimized in our case. And we, 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 we basically put, um, I mean, I I'm not, I, I don't understand the technology, but as I understand it, we hold your uh, Bitcoin um, safe in, if you like, cold storage. So, again, um, I think that uh, the hacking risks and all the rest of it are, mm -hmm. are minimized. So um, I, it's a service which our customers want. And, um, you know, if our customers want something, we try and provide it. Yep. Great stuff. Why we've always... Enjoyed working with Gold Money all the way back to the beginning of TFMR, which is now, geez, Louise Allister, seven or eight years ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so now as we head into 2018, like I said, we've got all these different um, things that will be quite the focus of attention in the new year, in 2018. I think I misspoke there a second ago. Um, but Allister, the thing I want to talk to you about is this, what is now apparently right on the horizon, and that's this. Uh, Yuan-denominated crude oil contract. You know, we've already got the Yuan-denominated uh, gold contract in Shanghai. And now they've, they've been running tests. They're making sure it's ready to go. And they must be getting close because there was this talk about a week ago uh, of Trump wanting to use the term economic aggressor when it comes to China. <laughs> um, Alistair, if anything, tell everybody a little bit about that contract, what you know of it, the, the Yuan denominated crude oil contract, and then how and why so many people think it could be a real game changer in this de-dollarization movement. Okay. Well, the first thing to say is the contract is ready to go. It's all set up. Um, the uh, energy exchange, uh, which is a subset of, as I understand it, of the um, uh, Shanghai International Futures Exchange, um, is all ready to go. They've done all the testing and all the rest of it. And all they need is the government to say, go. So that's in place. Um, the problem really with it is that um, it is quite likely that uh, some oil exporters to China uh, who are being encouraged, incidentally, very strongly to use the yuan in settlement rather than the dollar for their oil sales um, uh, might want to use financial instruments to hedge their, um, their Chinese yuan. And, of course, if you look at a, company, a country like Iran, um, who basically is blacklisted by, um, uh, for, for using the dollar, and in any event, they don't want to use Satan's currency, which is the way they look at it, um, uh, you know, they are quite likely to um, hedge quite a bit of their oil sales uh, uh, for which they're paid in yuan into physical gold. So um, the problem uh, that the Chinese have now seen is that when they first planned this oil for yuan contract, and this has been, um, you know, cooking ever since, I think, uh, 2012, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, they suddenly realized that actually this could um, generate huge uh, demand for fiscal gold in the market. Uh, not only that, but it would destroy the Petra currency and Therefore, it would destroy the status of the dollar as the international trade settlement currency. Now, they're going there anyway, but they want to get there at a pace which doesn't destroy America and the West in the process, if I can put it crudely. Yeah. Uh, so um, that has been the reason the whole thing has been held back. Um, 
I think the most recent development is important because Saudi Arabia, as uh, we are all aware, um, is doing more and more business with China. They're now competing uh, with Russia, which has uh, overtaken them in terms of being the largest supplier to China. Uh, and they've also, also got Angola. Angola are accepting yuan. Uh, Russia is accepting yuan. Now that leaves Saudi Arabia at a disadvantage. Saudi Arabia also had the problem that they need money. The only um, uh, um, if you like, country with deep enough pockets to help bail them out is one of their major customers, and that's China. So they're not in the position anymore, really, to protect the petrodollar, which was first set up in agreement between Nixon and King Faisal back in 1973. Mm -hmm. So you can see this is a problem. Now, I think as soon as um, uh, Saudi Arabia begins to accept yuan in payment for her oil. And I believe that this is likely to happen in the new year. The pressure to introduce um, instruments to help um, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, manage her foreign exchange risk obviously is going to become considerably greater. And it's almost impossible to see a situation where China just stands back and says, we want you to pay in yuan, but guess what? We're not going to provide you the, with the financial uh, facilities to do anything with your yuan. So, um, you know, this is complete nonsense, particularly when you bear in mind that uh, Dubai uh, has already a gold yuan contract. Now, if I was in the DIFC, which is the, which is the Dubai International, um, International Financial Center, I would think to myself, Look, we've got all these boys around here. We've got Iran, we've got Saudi, we've got Qatar and all the rest of it. And um, they're having to accept yuan more and more and more. OK, why don't I do uh, an oil contract settled in yuan? You know, I mean, it's there. So actually, if China doesn't do it, someone else is going to do it. And I think this is the point which um, mm -hmm. uh, people don't really appreciate, that while China has been controlling, if you like, the rate of at at, at which people have been moving over from using the dollar for trade settlement into using the yuan for trade settlement, I think that's getting beyond her control now because there are other people prepared to pr provide these facilities if the Chinese are too slow in doing so. So this is an exciting thing. And I think 2018, we're going to look back on it as the, as the year, I think, when the petrodollar was destroyed or it began to be destroyed. And of course, as soon as you start destroying the petrodollar, you're then asking a very fundamental question. Which is the largest trading nation in the world? China by a long, long short. Mm -hmm. um, where's America in this? America is retreating from international trade. She's talking about putting in tariffs, stopping yeah. foreigners selling her stuff. So actually, we've got a situation where you've got this reserve currency, which everybody is using, and the currency is issued by someone who actually doesn't want to have anything to do with foreign trade. So, you know, I mean, to me, it's a no brainer. I can see this being a really negative story for the dollar in yeah. 2018. And I think this is such an important point, uh, which is underappreciated. I mean, it's just it's just absolute craziness. I mean, you know, we're now sort of edging on to uh, Trump's uh, <laughs> trade policy, if you like. But effectively what we have, America is trying. Um, I, I mean, she issued this national security document um, uh, earlier this week. And what she's saying in that is that we want to continue to control the world and we will do so by military means. That effectively is the subtext in the whole thing. Right. Um, China and Russia, on the other hand, who are operating in partnership, uh, don't want to go down the military road. They're going down the financial road. And when it comes to destroying anyone, um, absent a nuclear war, really, the country which is on the wrong end of this is America, because uh, all China and Russia need do is just, um, if you like, just effectively take steps to remove the dollar from the international trade system. And it's something which they can do probably quite quickly. When I say quite, quite quickly, over a period of just a year or two. Um, now, on top of that, <coughs> Excuse me. bear in mind, 
that international portfolio investments are very heavily angled towards dollars, uh, mainly because uh, we had a dollar bull market until the beginning of this year. And uh, if you had your investments in any other um, uh, uh, currency, you were effectively losing out, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if you're accounting in dollars in any sense. So with everyone overweight in dollars, and at the last count, we're talking mid-2016, it was $17.3 trillion of portfolio investments um, held by foreigners. You can see that the potential for uh, dollars to be sold mm -hmm. from foreign hands back into the United States right. is absolutely enormous when this trade story hits the fan. Yeah. So this is this is, I think, a very interesting juncture. And of course, gold is the other side of the dollar. You know, if you're going to if you if you're going to sell the dollar, what do you buy? <laughs> you can buy Chinese yuan. And I wouldn't dissuade you from doing that because the Chinese are managing their currency in line with uh, the general level of industrial commodity prices. Um, they've been doing this for the last three years, so far as I can see. Um, but the other thing you could buy is gold. And, I, I, you know, I'm not saying that everybody's going to run out and buy gold, but the gold prices is going to begin to reflect, I think, um, not only a weakening dollar, but a dollar which is um, demonstrably on the run. I, I'm sitting here thinking, Alistair, as you've described it, if if someone were to go to Shanghai, say this contract gets put in place, and you uh, sell your crude oil for yuan, but yet the Chinese are not, they don't really have the facilities for you then to roll it into uh, uh, yuan treasuries, let's call it that, Chinese sovereign debt. And instead, they're in a, almost encouraging you to uh, trade your yuan for gold, isn't that almost like a de facto backing of the yuan with gold? Because that's that's basically what the dollar was, right, prior to uh, removal of the gold standard. Yes, you're not getting the convertibility into gold. Uh, and this is one thing I think I should make absolutely clear. Bear in mind that you, there are two yuan. There's an onshore yuan right. in onshore China and there's an offshore yuan. Mm -hmm. Effectively, what the Chinese are saying is we want you to sell your commodities to us and we will pay you in yuan. Right. You, you know, they'll even say we'll give you a better deal in yuan than in dollars. Perhaps. I mean, I think that's part of the subtext in, 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 in their approach. Um, then what they're going to be saying as they provide these facilities for you to do whatever hedging or whatever you want to do is if you want to hedge into gold, we're not going to sell you the gold because our gold is ring fenced domestically. We're hanging on to our government gold which between between us is is um, uh, considerably understated. Um, but right. also the citizens, um, uh, the residents in China are not allowed to sell their gold for overseas currencies. So, you know, you're going to have to go into the market and buy gold. So we have a situation where they've, you know, they've already cleared out the West of its loose gold stock, if you like. And goodness knows how many central banks are under-reporting, um, sorry, over-reporting their gold holdings because they've got commitments against it or it's been delivered out and they haven't admitted it and all the rest of it. Um, I, you know, the effect on the gold price actually could be quite substantial. Dramatic. And yeah. It, yeah. And now, again, the Chinese do mm. understand this. They do understand that they've actually hit the point where in trying to persuade people to deal with them in their, you know, in Chinese offshore yuan, they are going to drive up the gold price and they're going to drive down the dollar because all these relationships are going that way. And it's almost like they're on a cliff edge and <laughs> the dollar is about to go down. The effect of that is obviously going to be very detrimental to um, anything priced in dollars. Uh, it's going to be very detrimental to the U.S. economy. It's almost like declaring a financial nuclear conflict, if you like, with the yeah. American economy yeah. and with every other currency which ties itself to the dollar, which basically is the rest of us. Mm -hmm. So you can see that um, this situation does need some very, very careful handling. 
Um, now, I think Chinese have actually handled all this very, very well. They've been very patient. They've been sitting back and saying, you know, we're not doing anything. We're just letting the Americans make the mistakes. And that as a policy has worked very, very well. Um, we're now in the situation where um, they can't really control it quite in that sense anymore. Uh, there is a momentum, I think, building underneath markets, which uh, basically um, tell us that it's completely wrong for the largest trading nation in the world to turn around and say it doesn't want the one currency, the reserve currency, which is issued by the country that is withdrawing itself from international trade. Right. I mean, this is just craziness, absolute craziness. And I don't think the Chinese can really control it quite in the way in which they have in the past. I mean, they've, they've, they've very much encouraged everybody to use the yuan. They have been backpedaling when it comes to providing important um, uh, hedging tools, particularly this um, energy for yuan contract, oil for yuan contract. But I don't think they're in control of the timing quite as much anymore. And I think that's, um, we're getting to this sort of point where, you know, suddenly there's going to be something's got to break. Well, and that's the last, that's where I wanted to go here toward the end, Alistair, because, and, and thank you for that distinction, because that's important to note. I mean, it's not so much uh, the de facto yuan backed or gold backed yuan, like I was mentioning, because the gold's not going to come from the Chinese reserves. I mean, the, any gold that gets settled in a, uh, you know, in this swapping of yuan for gold is going to come from the open market. And so that's a very important distinction because that obviously has upward pressure on uh, uh, the price through demand. So now, Alistair, as we put it then together, you brought up an excellent point about uh, maybe someone in Dubai, uh, some organization in Dubai jumping the gun and uh, not necessarily forcing the Chinese hand, but just kind of speeding the process up by recognizing an economic opportunity to begin a contract like this. Uh, the Chinese seem to be getting close. We had this test run couple of weeks ago where they said this is the fifth time we want to make sure all the facilities work in our final minutes Alistair um, what is the likelihood do you think of these events beginning to take place uh, in 2018 I think it's, it's I, I can't see how they cannot take place um, because you know as you've just said I mean you've got guys sitting in Dubai thinking you know we're going to make money um, what's the next idea <laughs> right Ahmed, Ahmed. <laughs> well, the answer is very simple. We'll have a, an oil contract in Yuan because Iran just across the water is uh, selling um, uh, oil to China. Saudi Arabia is doing exactly the same thing. And the Chinese are investing in Saudi Arabia and bailing Saudi Arabia out. And by the way, they will probably buy that 5% stake um, in Aramco. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and and you know, this is a no-brainer, really. So, yeah. so I, Against, you know, uh, um, but uh, there is dollar he, uh, he, um, the gold hegemony, interest. Hegemony, I think is uh, is um, hegemony. Hegemony. important yeah, to yeah, understand. I think um, in context, uh, mm -hmm. and that is, I think the Chinese, um, you know, when they sort of sat down, I don't know, some time ago, and sort of worked out their financial strategy, let's call it their financial war strategy, they probably thought, well, you know, the big risk in this is that we actually destroy Western currencies. Now, if that's the case, we've got to survive that. And the only way we can survive that is to own the one asset, which is no one else's liability, and that is gold. Yep. And so I think um, it, it's, it's, it's worth bearing in mind that the regulations that appointed the People's Bank of China to begin to accumulate gold on behalf of the state uh, were dated in 1983. They have been accumulating gold since then. You know, all through those, those years when it went down through the big bear market all the way down to $250, $260 in 2000, 2002 and since. In 2002, a decision was taken to let the people buy gold. Now, this is very important because that tells us that at that state, at that stage, the state had acquired a substantial quantity of undeclared gold, not held, if you like, in official reserves, but held, call it off balance sheet, if you like. Um, 
so much gold had been acquired that they felt comfortable to encourage ordinary people to begin to um, acquire gold. Now, as a matter of principle, um, if you want to have um, a, a greater uh, level of peace um, in a country which has got all these diverse ethnic groups, there's something like 42 different ethnic groups in China, I think. Um, you know, I mean, if you didn't have a strong man at the top holding the whole thing together in a police state, I mean, it would be um, like the Arab Spring, um, <laughs> you know, uh, quintupled. I mean, mm. it really would be enormous, enormous chaos. That is why they have no democracy in China. But if you're going to get um, people to stay together um, through um, a financial war, then the best way to do it is is make sure they've got some gold. Because if they've got gold, they have got a reason not to go out on the streets and disrupt the status quo. Yep. Very, very important point. Yep, and I think I, I so I, you know, the way I see the Chinese strategy is gold is central to it. It's central because it is the biggest insurance policy they ha that they could possibly have against the West, either falling apart or declaring financial war uh, um, openly against against China. Um, but what it means is that, um, you know, it's it's fine so long as you can control the timing of things. But when the timing of things starts slipping from your hands, then we have a situation where, um, sir, and uh, now he's a big data guy. Uh, it wasn't just now big data. Welcome back. Thank you, Max. Great right. to be with so you. just to wrap up from our previous conversation, you know, you you went to the intelligence community and you said, hey, you know, markets throw off a lot of data. Right. And if you know how to read it, correct, it helps you, you know, predict the future or, as you would say in Wall Street, discount the future. Right. And then you've added a lot more data. And you've come up with this, uh, and you're at Mariglam, and you are the chief global strategist there. And uh, artificial intelligence, we didn't touch on that at all. And so does that uh, a key part of the product as such? Right. This is actually what they call third uh, artificial intelligence or AI. This is really third wave AI. So first, first wave is sort of you know, big data. Second wave was machine learning, so that the machine would re reach conclusions, which would then iteratively put it back into the algorithm. So now the machine is teaching itself. Third wave is external uh, inputs from something like Watson or other machines that can actually read plain language. So you know, every every 10Q, uh, 8K, um, you know, uh, all you know, 10Ks. Uh, footnotes, uh, hundreds of millions of pages of information. It can read all that more than any analyst or all of Wall Street combined could do. For meaning, uh, we're working with a Finnish team of cognitive scientists and linguists to to advance the state of the art in terms of word identification. Like I, I could write, write code that says, you know, look for Max and Kaiser in the same sentence, and it's probably you. Okay, but you can get way more sophisticated than that. We're doing all of that. Um, corporate okay, is there a risk of? Um, I just saw a video on uh, with China. You know, they they're have a remarkable data gathering abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, they are essentially surveying the entire population. Mm -hmm. um, they, people living there have given up the notion of privacy, more or less. Sure. They said, you know, we're willing to give up privacy completely uh, to the state. And um, is, is this a risk? Um, in other words, you're in the intelligence community. You're looking for attack vectors. Mm -hmm. You're looking to keep everybody safe. Mm -hmm. The trade-off is that you're putting a lot of data in there. It's coming from a lot of sources, social media, obviously, where people are pouring in their lives into social media. Right. And, um, it, you know, how much the privacy factor, how do you weigh in on that? Is it, a, is it the same world that we lived in 30 or 40 years ago? Has the world changed, uh, or are these things still valuable? Uh, it's absolutely uh, changed radically. It's not the same world we lived in 30 years ago. It is in some ways. The like human nature doesn't change. Human nature hasn't changed in 50,000 years. We're, we're basically uh, Ice Age cave people. Quick, quick in, digression, yeah. but if so many machines are inputting the data, aren't we, in fact, leaving kind of a human-based uh, society and moving more toward a machine-based society? Yeah, well, the machines are informing the data, then the data is making decisions based on the machines who are then taking that data and acting out their machine worlds, and then it goes in this uh, loop of feedback loop of machines to machines. So right. aren't we abdicating hum our humanity? You're a big guy in the whole 
Uh, you know, you're walking around like this. Yeah, you all know it. My, I talked to an Uber driver. He calls them the blue faces. Poor people get in the back of the car, and they're all staring at the screens, and their faces are blue in the dark, but they're not talking oh, I, to I, each I, other. I understood. So, so you, you, you've opened up a thought here where you, you, you're conflicted. You're, you, you feel a bit conflicted about all this. In other words, the, the dividing line for you is that the data has to be safe and, and used for, let's say, national strategic interests. Sure. Okay. But, you know, the, the data gets hacked. All data gets hacked. Right. We haven't seen a database not get hacked. Correct. The government database gets hacked traded. all the yeah, time. I mean, beyond, or, or beyond Obama, like Snowden, yeah. let's say, targeting folks, right. I mean, obviously, that's clearly a dictatorial breach of the Constitution. Correct. Uh, and that's bad. But, but, the, but the data gets hacked all the time, right. too. So how do you resolve that conflict? In other words, you feel comfortable that your work, which is heavily dependent on data surveillance, in the, in, and you've given up on privacy... And, and, and you've uh, admitted that th this is seemingly like the work of the devil. How do you, Jim Rickards, you know, what, what, what institution in America today do you trust? In other words, you trust this institution right. and you can say, you know what, all this stuff troubles me, but I know that X is unimpeachable and, I'm, and I salute the flag t to right. that. What is that institution? Well, I'm a member of the most counter-cultural organization on earth, which is the Catholic Church. We're, we're so out of fashion with the you know, conventional wisdom. So that's, that's an institution I trust. But um, getting back to my work versus you know, the work of the NSA, we're using completely open source data. So we, yeah, we buy a price fee from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the New York Stock. Anybody can do that. It's not free. But anybody can get that information. Um, you know, if Twitter's out there, if I, you know, I use Twitter a lot. I, I have an open Twitter account. You don't have to belong to Twitter to read my account. So I choose to put that information out there, and so do hundreds of millions of other people. So that's, that's not really what but I But the, pro that's the, not the algorithms are troubling, Jim. You know, the algorithms yes. can be programmed to make money on Wall Street. You know, they pick a price, and then they do the trades to meet that price. Sure. They manipulate markets. So, of course. It, so the algorithms can be used to manipulate social behavior. You know, Facebook they has are. been caught. They are. Manipulating social behavior absolutely, with their news feed. Absolutely, absolutely okay? right. So Which you're why... you're developing a w more sophisticated, weaponized version of this with this product. Well, Isn't that getting into some more trouble? Look, we're doing something very specific, which is, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you where the euro is going to be tomorrow. We're going to tell you where the euro is going to be in six months. What the Fed's going to do in six months. You know how the economy is going to do. Those are we're we're sort of long, you know, kind of intermediate to longer range. Uh, predictive analytics in capital markets. We're not trying to sell you a book. We're not trying to, you know, we offer this to institutions. How about investors. this for a vector? You say, oh, there's a bomb coming in from jihadis. Right. Okay, we predict it. So we're going to drone them. Yeah. Okay, does the database say, wow, you know, we invaded their country a few years ago to take all their oil and resources and we're a out of control empire and we're murdering people for money. Does the model suggest that maybe the actions of the U.S. military should be curbed in that sense and maybe there should be a more comprehensive... Serial ledger technology. Not Bitcoin, by the way. Bitcoin's a, a sideshow. A serial but, ledger? I mean, I, I mean I a, a, a distri distributed ledger. Distribu yeah, th that's the new name for like blo a, mm -hmm. blockchain. blockchain. DLT, distributed ledger. distributed ledger technology. Distributed ledger, uh, military-grade encryption, and maybe they'll have a Putin coin or a G coin. It won't be Bitcoin, but they'll come up with their own coin uh, and then transact among themselves. Right. So maybe Russia is paying for China with this Putin coin, and China settling its. So it's a de-dollarization. Correct. Which you predicted for correct. many years. That's right. That's right. Ho ho ho! Merry Christmas. This is our pre-Christmas episode. It's going out a few days before Christmas. We don't actually have an episode this year on Christmas Day, but you know, a lot of people say Santa Claus is not real. They think it's just magical thinking. So I thought my headlines today would reflect this magical thinking. Obviously, Santa's real because we're all getting a lot of presents, right? Magical thinking is stopping us from taking to the streets. This is from Truth Dig, and they were looking at this tax reform policy and how it's a big, huge giveaway for the wealthy and taking from the poor again. And they're asking, why is nobody going out in the street? And part of it is the magical thinking that, you know, the Russiagate hoax will save us or, or one of their various magical thinkings that if we go to the voting booth and we'll elect somebody and, and somehow that person's going to fight for on our behalf rather than the corporation's behalf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in other words, uh, there is no there there. There's no help coming. There's no cavalry. There's no place like home. 
There's only ruby slippers that you can click three times and take you over the rainbow to a fairly magic land of shillelagh sticks and leprechauns where only cryptocurrencies grow. <laughs> yes, of course you can take Bitcoin to the afterlife and to your fantasy world. <laughs> Many call Bitcoin a fantasy currency, but those are not my headlines. Uh, I'm going to look, I'm going to answer the question of why people aren't taking to the streets and I'm going to talk oh. about these fantasy headlines. And the first headline here might be one reason why people are not taking to the streets. Robots are being used to deter homeless people from setting up camp in San Francisco. In San Francisco, autonomous crime fighting robots that are used to patrol parking lots sports arenas and tech company campuses are now being deployed to keep away homeless people. The San Francisco Business Times reported that the San Francisco SPCA, an animal advocacy and pet adoption group, put a security robot to work outside its facilities in the gentrifying Mission neighborhood. The robot's presence is meant to deter homeless people from setting up camps along the sidewalks. So the robot is known as K-9, and it's, it's there to uh, prevent crime. Well, this is obviously part of a dystopian, comprehensive foreign policy that doesn't prize uh, g genocide in this way. Right. Okay, so we're not policymakers. Uh, I can't tell the Pentagon. But is it in the data? If the data is blind and it just looks at specific outcomes, you're facilitating and exacerbating a failed policy, and you're making death for hire and nor normalizing it. You know, one thing we don't do is get our blood pressure up. We're, we're analysts. We, we, get the, we get the information. We do, we do consider geopolitics in addition to capital markets. I can't tell Rex Tillerson what to do in North Korea. I can't tell General Mattis what to do in North Korea. But we can analyze it using a, a Bayesian statistic, an a priori hypothesis about the probability of war in North Korea. We update the probability all the time. Actually, w within the last 24 hours, my probability of war with North Korea, which was 70%, uh, went down a little bit. I extended the timeline. I had it before the end of March. Now I'll kind of go out to summer based on some things that Rex Torson said yesterday to the Atlanta Council. That's an example of good Bayesian updating. Don't get married to a particular conclusion, but increase or decrease the probabilities based on incoming data. So we do analyze it. And we do advise clients uh, as to you know what we see coming, but we don't change the outcome. I'm not, I'm not, pushing, in, the, I'm not pushing the trigger so on a drone missile. Sometimes we get a rent-a-car, we do the geo-locating sure. system, I never use it's those. not working, yeah. and it says drive into that brick wall. Right. You know, I don't drive into the well, brick wall, all, I override the system. This happened to me recently. I was with my wife. We were in Australia. We were in the outback. We had the driver. We a very bright guy, nice guy. He couldn't have been nicer. But he had one of those uh, GPS kind of things. And we're driving. All of a sudden, he turns off the main highway. We're going to a dirt road. And then he gets on like a, a tertiary road. And I'm like, is this guy going to like take us somewhere, turn around and shoot us and rob us? Like, what's going on? You seem like a nice guy. He gets to a fence. He goes, oh, uh, the thing says I can keep going, but I can't. He had to turn around right. all the way up. Well, that's my point. I, well, so well, 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 But you're right. But I never do that. I, I use maps. I'm actually old yeah, but you're, school. I you're, get a you're, map you're, 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 Okay. I wanna, I, my point is I want to touch on a couple other things here. Sure. On the Kaiser Report years ago, yeah, the U.S. first pulled the trigger on weaponizing SWIFT, you remember. Sure. Uh, which is it, international, uh, you know, against Iran. Society for a while, yeah. Um, and you, and you, the alternative, you, you predicted that alternative payment systems would erupt. That's kind of what's happening, right? Correct. Iran, Russia, Venezuela, these countries that are being sanctioned and they're abusing SWIFT, they're inventing, thanks to algorithms, thanks to technology, thanks to cryptocurrencies, they're inventing their parallel systems. Sure. Is that a good trend? Uh, not for the United States. It's good for them. I mean, this is this is geopolitical hardball. I'm on the the board of a think tank in Washington called the Center for Sanctions and Illicit Finance, and my colleagues, you know, great people. These are people who kind of invented uh, the financial war on terror. Meaning, they they were they were in the White House, in the Treasury after 9/11 during the Bush administration. All the laws that that, that we live with today. They either wrote those laws or wrote the regulations or enforced them. And, I, and they've been extremely effective. This stuff is really powerful. But I tell them, be careful what you wish for, because if you keep hammering people with this, de-swifting them, which we've done to a number of countries, they're going to do the workaround. Well, they're almost there. So I would expect Russia and China to come up with. You're, you're an art. You're a, you're a Christian. You know, you're you're a big fan of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, is this it seems like we're forsaking our humanity for the for the, for the mark of the beast. This is the devil, Jim. Are you are you caving into the devil? Uh, I'm not caving into the devil, but I think you're you're onto something in your description of this. And uh, this is what Ray Kurzweil calls the singularity: is the merger of man and machine. So, and you know, this is portrayed in uh, Blade Runner 2049, which I saw. I thought it was a great movie, by the way. Everyone hated it. I just 
I love I love three hour movies where nothing happens. That was kind of, but it was it was very very deep. But yeah, that that's where we're merging on. now. What uh, and the government's involved in this, of course, but the private uh, the private firms, you know, the Google, the Facebook, we all know who they are, Yahoo and Amazon and all that. I mean, they're just data mining like crazy. And you know, I'm, I like I like books. I buy a lot of books, you know. And so I buy a book and says, well, you bought this one, you might want to buy this one too. Well, often it's yeah, that's interesting. And maybe I will buy it. So they're they're obviously onto something. Privacy is gone. Uh, you know, you okay. So just just to, just to, so in other words, the question was one of privacy, and your Privacy's feeling gone. there is that privacy is gone. Correct. And and you feel comfortable with that? No, I don't. I'm, I'm acknowledging your point. I, I agree but, completely. But the, the trade-off for security is privacy. In other words, if I felt like I would be surveyled less and another 9/11 would happen, right? I, I'm since I'm a New Yorker, I'd say yeah. I don't give it. I don't care. Right. Let another 9/11 happen because you know stuff happens. Big right. big deal. You know I don't get it. I don't understand the huge response to 9/11 to begin with. Here's here's what troubles me. Uh, I would I would not care if the NSA surveyed everything I do. They don't actually do that, but they you know they 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 suck up a lot of metadata. We all know. I wouldn't really care about that if I had confidence that it was only being used for national security purposes. But I don't. We saw during the Obama administration with you know Lois Lerner surveillance of the Tea Party and uh, prosecutions of uh, uh, General Petraeus and Dinesh D'Souza. I'm not saying that they both pleaded guilty. I'm not saying they didn't do anything wrong. I'm saying they were singled out for political reasons, and there's a lot of that. So I have no confidence that while the government's collecting the data, ostensibly for national security purposes, all it takes is somebody like Obama and uh, Valerie Jarrett to, to target you, and then all of a sudden that's a whole different world. So that, that's troubling to me. The other thing I think where, where people can resort to self-help, this stuff is addictive, uh, and that's, you know, it's, it's just very basic biochemistry. So, you know, why are people addicted to heroin? Because it feels good. Well, that's, you know, endorphins and things. Well, those endorphins are triggered by a lot of things other than drugs. Uh, I mean, they're, they're sex addicts, they're alcohol addicts, they're gambling addicts. There are the many, many kinds of behavior that are all addictive, that have the same biochemistry. Well, it's pretty clear at this point that holding that thing in your hand. So I've started just, you know, I go out and leave my cell phone home. You know, I just I try doing that more and more. But uh, social media is addictive because it gives you a, a, a high or a buzz. Well, it touches on the same I think endorphin. The devices, right. I, I think social media way. is addictive in that way, but I think that it's the devices themselves. This goes back to uh, a little before most people's time, but Marshall McLuhan said the medium is the message. It wasn't so much the content, it was the medium that you were getting it through. So I mean, I, you know, I come into New York a lot. I was, came down here uh, to the studio today, and I, I had my cell phone in my pocket. It was off. I turned it on later. But everyone's 